So the election this Saturday represents a political earthquake in Ireland. It's going to be seen, I think, as a before and after moment in Irish history, when for uh, the, the first time in the, in the history, in, the, in this century, which the two-party system has basically served the interests of the ruling class in Ireland, that uh, political setup has received a, a shattering blow, with Sinn Féin topping the poll with 24% of the vote, and the two main right-wing capitalist parties, Fianna Foil and Fianna Gael, received respectively 22% and less than 21% in the case of Fianna Gael. Um, and this represents a, a political earthquake in Ireland. It is uh, shaking the foundations of one of the key pillars of the, uh, of the establishment and of the capitalist system in Ireland, the two-party system. Um, <clears throat> and really it represents the fact that Ireland has now caught up with the rest of the world. It was previously uh, hailed by some liberal commentators as defying the collapse of the centre ground. You had Leo Varadkar, the Taoiseach until recently, uh, presenting himself as basically Ireland's answer to Emmanuel Macron. Uh, he was the saviour of the centre ground, uh, and we'd seen apparently in Ireland, despite the fact that there was a, uh, a massive effect from the 2008 crisis, a 64 billion euro bailout back in 2008, uh, an ECB bailout, and, uh, and, and everything else that went along with it, a, year, a decade of austerity. Despite that fact, you'd seen no Podemos, you'd seen no Syriza, you'd seen no rise of populism either of the left or of the right. And so there was this idea of Irish exceptionalism, that Ireland was somehow immune from the processes of the disintegration of the centre ground of political polarisation, of instability, that is tearing apart every capitalist regime around the world, basically. Uh, now that, uh, that illusion, basically, has been shattered with this election, which took everyone by surprise. Um, in fact, it, it, it even took many on the left, and including Sinn Féin themselves, were completely taken by surprise with this, particularly after the, the poor performance that the left uh, suffered last year in the European elections. Um, and therefore, as a result, they only put forward uh, a number of, uh, in, in the 40s, uh, candidates for, the, for, for TDs, for the candidates for the Doyle elections. And therefore, as a result, actually, of this underestimation of their own strength, um, Sinn Féin actually were pipped to the post in terms of the number of uh, representatives in the Doyle, with 37 as against Fianna Foyle, who have 38. Nonetheless, despite this fact, the, uh, there are very few options now for the ruling class in Ireland going forward. The situation is extremely bleak and extremely unstable now going forward. Um, now, the, uh, what, what underlies this uh, situation? Well, the ruling class hoped and miscalculated uh, with this election because they hoped it would be an election around, for example, the handling of Brexit or uh, the two parties were compete the two main right wing capitalist parties were competing with each other over the question of which is the more economically competent, whatever that means. Um, however, in this election, what fundamentally came to the fore was class anger. This was the basis of this huge political upset that has happened in Ireland. Um, class questions dominated this election, and what it shows is a tremendous swing to the left uh, uh, politically amongst the working class and amongst the youth in Ireland. Um, in fact, when voters were asked what the main reasons were for them voting for the first preference party. You have a preference system in Ireland with the, with the uh, uh, single transferable vote system. Uh, they, the, the, the leading answer was the question of health care with 32% answering that that was the, the reason they voted for their party followed by housing on around 25%, uh, with Brexit only at 1% and immigration itself only at 1%. Um, and in fact, it should be mentioned as an aside that the, the, the far right in Ireland did exceptionally badly. Um, they did atrociously with uh, Gemma O'Doherty, one of the most prominent far right uh, candidates, receiving less than 2%. Now, why is this? Again, we've been told by some of the liberal commentators that there is some sort of mysterious exceptionalism in Ireland. But the reason actually that right wing populism wasn't able to uh, succeed in these elections was fundamentally it proves the fact that the right only prosper where there is the lack of a bold left wing clear alternative. And this was clearly the case in Ireland. You had this uh, left wing. Uh, alternative in Sinn Féin as far as the majority of workers and youth were concerned. And Sinn Féin actually ran on a very left-wing program, uh, a, a program of, of very progressive left-wing reforms, uh, such as, for example, abolishing regressive taxations, uh, introducing a, a rent freeze. Uh, in, in Ireland at the moment you have a, a well, you have a booming economy, and this is leading to a speculative property boom, and a result of that for ordinary working class people is that they are not feeling the benefits of this boom. You are seeing rents skyrocketing. Uh, you're talking about one and a half thousand euros a month for, for, to rent a, a poxy little apartment in, in Dublin. And... Um, 
Therefore, these promises to freeze rent, uh, for tax rebates for working class families, uh, for, to build 100,000 new homes, uh, to invest heavily in healthcare, in education and so on, and to do this on the basis of progressive taxation that would take that money from the, the banks and the multinationals who are hoarding that money, this was a very left-wing program. It was a class-based program and it appealed to the working class and the youth and it was tremendously successful uh, in doing so. And uh, in fact, amongst the, uh, uh, all age groups except the over 65s, Sinn Féin came out as the biggest party. And amongst the under 25s, Fianna Gael and Fianna Foyle, the two main right-wing pro-capitalist parties, uh, came out with uh, less than 30% of the vote, which is an astonishing figure. But even taken overall, combined they were only able, these are the two main parties of the two-party system in Ireland that has existed since the Civil War uh, in, in, in the 20s effectively. Um, um, they only took a combined vote share of 42%. So therefore this represents a shattering blow to the two-party system and it has caused panic actually amongst the upper echelons of the capitalist class in Ireland. And this is reflected nowhere else better than on the stock exchange where you've seen a collapse in share price of some very, uh, it's very, very significant where the, the, this turbulence in the stock market is most affected. Uh, the Bank of Ireland, for example, has seen an 8.31% fall in their share prices since the election. AIB has seen a 5.44% fall in their share price and 700 million euros wiped off the value of their shares. And then you have others, uh, uh, construction companies, uh, landlord, landlord conglomerates, the biggest landlord in Ireland, uh, um, uh, one particular company lost 8.62% of the value of its shares. So you can see the banks, the construction companies, the landlords in particular are terrified at, uh, at the rise of Sinn Féin. And they understand the revolutionary implications actually of, uh, of this development, uh, which we'll go on to in a minute. But um, uh, throughout this campaign, you could see that actually the consciousness in Ireland uh, shifted extremely quickly. There are a whole number of uh, indications of this fact. Um, <clears throat> And it was only in the last two weeks that you saw a dramatic rise in, in, in Sinn Féin's uh, numbers, polling numbers. Uh, and suddenly the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class in Ireland, began to panic. And they responded, first of all, of course, by trying to lock out Sinn Féin, trying to ignore them uh, um, and, uh, and so on. In fact, many people uh, uh, compared the behaviour of RTE, the public news broadcaster in Ireland, to, the, to its behaviour in the 19, up until the 1990s with the Section 31 censorship laws against Sinn Féin and the IRA. Um, of course, at a certain point, that was, it was impossible to ignore them any longer. They tried to keep uh, Sinn Féin out of the big leaders debate between the Fianna Gael and Fianna Foyle leaders, Varadka and Michael Martin. Um, uh, but of, of course, eventually, it was impossible to ignore their rise any further. It was necessary to, uh, to, to change tack, essentially, and this is what the ruling class did with a, uh, a vicious campaign of attacks which really had a bit of the whiff of the panic of the British capitalist class in, in, in December and, and previously with, when faced with the, uh, the, the challenge of, of Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, you had uh, all sorts of reasons that they said that Sinn Féin is not a normal party. We can't possibly go into, into coalition with Sinn Féin. Both Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil ruled this out. And the reasons given, well, apparently uh, it was because of Sinn Féin's opposition to the Special Criminal Court, uh, uh, which was introduced in the 1970s and is an absolute uh, travesty in terms of getting rid of the democratic right to trial by jury. Uh, but they tried to make out that Sinn Féin was soft on crime. They, they said it was about the centralised structure of Sinn, of Sinn Féin. And then, of course, they pulled out of the hat inevitably the question of their IRA links and in particular the murder of a young man called Paul Quinn in 2007. Uh, all of this actually though had no effect whatsoever and in fact the, uh, the Independent, one of the, the main uh, pro-capitalist newspapers in Ireland, asked the question, this, this, and in, uh, the headline was quite indignant, they said, so why didn't young voters care about Sinn Féin crimes? And the conclusion they come to is that this election was all about edgy millennials basically just uh, uh, um, proving their edginess by voting for Sinn Féin despite their connections with the IRA. Of course this is a completely condescending outlook and, and completely fails to understand what motivated the, the large numbers of workers and youth who turned in a big way towards Sinn Féin. Fundamentally they were attracted by Sinn Féin because of their left-wing bold program and secondly they were repulsed by this anti-establishment campaign. 
which was being which was transparent in its cynicism and, and, and in the class fear which it represented the ruling class in Ireland care no more about the uh, the death of Paul Quinn than the the British ruling class care about anti-semitism in the Labour Party quite frankly it was cynically being used by the ruling class to try to to discredit uh, a party which which they feared because of the mass of workers and youth which they saw behind that party and in fact actually uh, it should be said that the uh, the campaign by the ruling class um, was uh, was uh, so uh, vociferous against Sinn Féin that it actually had the effect of painting the party as more anti-establishment than it actually was. It bolsters their anti-establishment credentials, despite the fact that Sinn Féin, for the past few years under Mary Lou Macdonald, their leader, has been increasingly angling to enter into coalition, to presenting itself, trying to present itself as more respectable, so as to be a future coalition partner with one of the two main uh, right-wing uh, pro-capitalist parties. And if we look in the north, of course, the the the, the, the rhetoric that uh, Sinn Fein, the left-wing rhetoric that Sinn Fein has been using in the south, uh, jars very uh, very much uh, with the their behaviour in the north, where for ten years they've been in coalition with uh, the DUP. Let us not forget where they've been carrying out austerity, they've been carrying out uh, PF, P PFI implementation, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, yeah, we see that they have been uh, uh, presented themselves and succeeded in presenting themselves as, a, as an anti-establishment party. But why, I think this is the question, why is it that the ruling class in Ireland are so afraid of Sinn Féin? What is it exactly that they are afraid of? This party, for example, has shown on a number of occasions, as I've mentioned, that they are prepared to compromise. They're prepared to go into coalition with the right wing. They're prepared to, to water down their programme. And in fact, when, uh, of, of course, this question of the murder of this young man in 2007 was raised, uh, they were, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they held their hands up and... Uh, 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 particularly the, the leadership in, in, in Dublin wanted to be seen to be doing something about it, to understand, to be understanding and so on. They wanted to distance themselves from their IRA past and everything else. Of course, all of these things, the IRA past, the centralised structure of the party, all of these are fundamentally excuses. It has nothing to do with this whatsoever. It is the masses behind Sinn Féin fundamentally that the bosses are deathly afraid of. It's not Sinn Féin per se, it is the masses that stand behind them. Uh, and in fact, to understand, I think, really, the fear of the ruling class, we have to look at how Ireland has been developing, really over the course of decades. Now, um, uh, as, I, as I say, the, uh, the, the ruling class in Ireland, uh, the, the, the capitalist class, um, after gaining independence in the 1920s, came to power on the back of a treaty with the British, which agreed to partition Ireland. Um, and, uh, of course, that partitioning of Ireland led to a civil war. And out of, those, out of that civil war issued the two main pro-capitalist parties. On one side you had the pro-treaty side, which became Fianna Gael, and on the other side you had the anti-treaty side, which became Fianna Foyle. There was obviously a lot of enmity between these two parties on account of the fact that they were on either side of the, of the civil war. It should be noted that Fianna Foyle, despite presenting themselves as a Republican party, opposed the treaty with the British, not because they were opposed to partition or anything else, but because of their actual opposition to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the fact that Ireland, or the south of Ireland as it is, the free state as it was, was uh, a, d a dominion of the British Empire and they had to, uh, uh, they had to um, give the oath of loyalty to the British Crown still. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the, the basis of capitalist rule in Ireland was based upon this two-party system uh, and, and the, the, the domination in particular of Ireland by the Catholic Church that guaranteed the, the spiritual domination of the capitalist class over the masses in Ireland. Ireland was held in a state of backwardness and the, uh, the, the ruling class in Ireland has always rested upon everything that is backward and reactionary in Irish society. But Ireland has gone through a tremendous transformation in the past few decades. Uh, in particular, since the 1990s, you've had a massive boom of investment called the Celtic Tiger, where fundamentally it was American uh, high-tech uh, capital flooded into Ireland using Ireland as a low-tax base of operations to penetrate the European market. Now, this had a huge transformative effect over the course of decades. Between 1994 and 2008, Ireland uh, witnessed an average growth rate per year of 7.4%. This completely transformed Ireland. Uh, and in, in particular, 
uh, the most progressive outcome of that, uh, that period of boom has been the creation of a youthful, urban, educated working class that is unburdened by tradition, unburdened by defeats. It is probably one of the most youthful and educated working classes in the whole of Europe. Um, and for uh, uh, and this is a this is a revolutionary factor in Irish society. Now, why has it been then that since 2008 there has apparently uh, been no social explosion like we've seen in say Greece or Portugal or Spain? Well, the uh, uh, of course there have been big strikes. There has there have been very bitter episodes of class struggle, particularly after 2008 and 2009 and 10. You had big public sector strikes, but of course the trade union leaders themselves. The leadership of the workers' movement was capable temporarily and partially to paralyse the, the, the working class through their misleadership. They came to a whole number of deals with the, with the one right-wing regime after another to hold back the workers, accepting austerity and accepting their role as basically strike breakers. This was the role that the trade union leaders have played since 2008. Um, and uh, of course then the, the ruling class were able with this in partnership with the trade unions to, to force one round of austerity, one round of pay restraint after another upon the working class. And you've had one government after another has been carrying this out. But of course we as Marxists we understand that eventually an accumulation of stresses leads to a turning point. That just like in the tectonic plates uh, within the Earth's crust. Eventually the build-up of pressure leads to a slippage. You have a revolution, an earthquake. Quantity transforms into quality. This is how we refer to it. And what we can see, if you look beneath the surface, and these em empiricists, these liberal commentators, are completely incapable of looking beneath the surface, basically. What you've seen in Ireland is a, is a slow crumbling, actually, of the, of the establishment, of the basis of capitalist rule in Ireland that has led to a crisis of the entire regime uh, eventually emerging. Uh, uh, and now exploding spectacularly. Um, first of all, post-2008, up until 2011, you actually had a Fianna Fáil uh, government in, uh, uh, in coalition with the Green Party uh, carrying out um, austerity. And then in 2011 you had an election, Fianna Fáil were kicked out, uh, the Green Party collapsed, and you had a huge surge in, in favour of the Labour Party. They went from about 10% up to 20% on the basis of left-wing language. Um, so you could see the masses were already at this time looking for a way out. Uh, of course, then they were themselves, uh, they went into coalition with Fina Gale. Again, you had another right-wing government carrying out austerity and attacks upon the working class. Uh, and they, in, in turn, collapsed and have completely collapsed about 4 or 5% now. They're in irrelevance. They're, they've been reduced to the status of a, of a reformist sect, basically, in Ireland. Um, and then in 2016, with, those, with the election then, for the first time in the history of the state, you have the, the two main parties getting less than 50% of the vote together. And therefore, for the capitalist class to establish stable rule, Fine Gael and Fianna Foyle, that have been at each other's throats apparently, uh, at least in appearances since the Civil War, were forced to rest upon each other through the confidence and supply arrangement. It was a grand coalition in all but name, essentially. Um, and uh, this has completely, of course, discredited the, the, the two-party system. This, is, this was a turning point. Um, and uh, they needed, uh, however, despite the fact that uh, this was not good from the point of view of the ruling class, it exposed the bankruptcy of the two-party system. Um, nevertheless, it was necessary because Ireland was entering into a period where you had not only the need to impose more and more austerity, uh, and now that is still the case, they need a strong government to carry out austerity. Despite the fact that Ireland is booming once more, they have 200 billion euros worth of state debt, which is about more than 40 uh, thousand euros for every man, woman and child in the Republic. Um, uh, and they, they still have this debt despite the fact that we're coming to the end of this boom now. There is a new recession approaching. We can see, this, we can see all of the symptoms of this on a world scale. And therefore the ruling class need to get fighting fit for this new recession which is approaching. Um, and so they, 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 they need the working class to take more. The working class, on the other hand, has taken about as much as they can take. They can see that there is a boom and they're demanding uh, um, that they get their fair share, which they see that, as they, uh, they, they, see that they haven't had any, any, any of the share of the, 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 this latest boom that, uh, that is re-emerging. 
And so the working class has taken all it can take and the ruling class needs them to take more. This is a, this is a, a recipe for social explosions. And we've seen now already with very um, militant strikes where the, where the trade union leaders are not able to hold the working class back any longer. You've seen an explosion of class struggle. A couple of years ago, you saw the bus Aryan uh, strike, which uh, turned into effectively a wildcat public transport general strike. Last year, you saw, of course, the nurses uh, strike. So even though the strike levels are on a very low level uh, uh, because of the role of the trade union leaders, where they do occur, it's extremely bitter, uh, uh, bitterly fought uh, struggles are taking place. Workers have basically taken about as much as they can take, and yet they need a strong government to, for them to, to implement greater austerity from the point of view of the ruling class. But then there are other questions as well, of course. Brexit is added into the mix. Uh, and then, of course, you have the question of the national question re-emerging in the north of Ireland. And so uh, um, <clears throat> the, the rise of Sinn Féin is in this context, of course. They are promising, on the one hand, progressive taxation, which would undermine the, the basis of the entire economy, of course, in the south of Ireland, that you have a, a very parasitic ruling class which bases itself on attracting foreign direct investment through uh, low tax levels. Uh, and of course, the masses behind them with tremendous expect placing tremendous expectations upon them and thirdly i mentioned uh, already of course the the national question was low on the agenda in terms of the reasons people voted for Sinn Féin nonetheless from the point of view of the ruling class they're now facing a dilemma what do they do what sort of government do they form now of course they can uh, 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 they can try to exclude Sinn Féin uh, that is uh, that is a possibility they can Fina Gale, Fina Foyle, the Greens can try to form, and, and whoever else could try to form some sort of everyone but Sinn Féin coalition, but that has its, its own problems, of course, because it would only be Sinn Féin and the left-wing parties that would represent any opposition whatsoever, and therefore it would only bolster Sinn Féin further down the line. So they could, have, they could try for, for such a thing, although, of course, for their own, for their own particular reasons, uh, uh, certain of the parties may not wish to go into it for their own personal reasons, even if that is not if is in the interest of the ruling class or and some within Fianna Foyle in particular oppose this uh, the ruling class could uh, could bring Sinn Féin into government they could bring them e into government either as part of a right-wing coalition or they could stand aside and allow them to try and form a left-wing coalition and act as an opposition essentially um, in fact you've had some within Fianna Foyle basically saying that the uh, Sinn Féin needs uh, a, a, a lick of government to basically take the shine off of them that's what that that's the the way that some of in the ruling class see it but that is poses with it all sorts of dangers there's going to be huge pressures on Sinn Féin from the mass, uh, the mass of workers who have who've had enough basically and who do see this party as a left-wing party. Um, uh, and of, of course uh, the, uh, for in, in, in exchange for any coalition that Fianna Foyle would uh, um, be able to put together, cobble together with Sinn Féin, although that's looking unlikely, and Sinn Féin have their own reasons that <clears throat> they, they're, they're not stupid of course, uh, they've seen what's happened to the Labour Party and the Greens in the past. Uh, what would happen? To th that is a sign of what would happen to Sinn Féin if they go into coalition with the right-wing parties. Um, but uh, any coalition, of course, would require some sort of compromises, uh, some sort of compromises in particular on the national question. And increasingly, that is going to become a very important question in the coming years. Uh, we've seen with the collapse of Stormont three years ago, <clears throat> But of course the situation is very unstable and Brexit has only added to that instability. Um, and the ruling class in Ireland don't want to touch the national question with a barge pole. Uh, they, they do not want to take possess possession of the North. They don't want reunification in actual fact, despite the fact that it's actually a very popular amongst the mass of workers and youth in the South. It's, you're talking about upwards of 70% being in favour. Of, uh, of, of reunification. The ruling class themselves, however, the capitalists, the bosses, they don't want reunification. Number one, they can't afford to, to, to basically subsidize uh, the North, to the, which the British state is currently doing to the tune of about 10 billion pounds each year. Uh, they are much less able to actually uh, carry out that subsidy. Um, but there are other reasons, of course. They don't want to come into conflict with uh, uh, British imperialism, and if they, they do start uh, raising the question of a border poll, if they do start raising a question of reunification with Ireland, that is going to bring the, the, the capitalist class in the south of Ireland onto a big uh, collision with their far more powerful uh, capitalist neighbour in Britain. Um, 
And finally, of course, I think this is important to state when discussing this national question, uh, Sinn Féin themselves have called for uh, uh, an all-island forum to basically discuss the question of unification. <clears throat> and when, as we see, the entire two-party system is in crisis, the constitutional basis of the state and therefore of capitalist rule in Ireland is, be is in crisis, is being questioned, every pillar of the state uh, and every pillar of the establishment is, in, is, is, is mired in, in in crisis and in scandal, from the Gardaí to the to the courts to the the politicians, um, they don't want to throw open the question to a generalised debate involving the masses across Ireland. Uh, they don't want to bring in the masses into politics to discuss these sort of questions. Which the question of unification, of course, it would open open up an entire debate on the constitutional basis of the state. And so we see, despite all of this, then. The options which present themselves to the ruling class are extremely limited. Uh, the, uh, the, the, there is one alternative, of course, which is that they don't manage to cobble together anything. None of the parties manage to cobble together anything. From the point of view of the ruling class, this is even worse because it will mean new elections and possibly Sinn Féin coming out even stronger. Um, but I think what's, uh, what's important to state is that despite the fact that Sinn Féin historically as a party going back to the 70s, represented a, a, a right-wing traditionalist split actually within republicanism. Despite the fact that its program is, uh, is contradictory, it is doing one thing in the north and saying another in the south, uh, uh, and, and despite the fact that the, the basis that they are arguing for unification of the republicanism of the Sinn Féin leadership is on the basis of, of reunifying on a capitalist basis, they don't talk about a 32-county socialist republic anymore. Uh, nonetheless, the, the, the ruling class in Ireland fears the masses which stands behind Sinn Féin and fears in a distorted way that the masses of Ireland will reconnect with their revolutionary traditions, that they will reconnect with the tradition of socialist republicanism, the tradition of James Larkin, of, of James Connolly, and that once the working class rediscovers these traditions, they will find themselves up against an invincible enemy, basically, uh, equipped with the correct ideas to overthrow capitalism in Ireland. They see that their period of stability is gone now, and the period which opens up is a period of instability, and it is going to be a period which is going to be a sharp learning curve for the masses in Ireland, in which they will rediscover their revolutionary traditions.